Divine Truth Interviews. Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Mary Magdalene is interviewed by Eloisa Lytton Hitchens on the topic of Mary identity. The interview was held on the 2nd of September 2013 in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia. This is session one, part two. Have you considered that you believe you are Mary Magdalene because of false memory syndrome or mind control? I've examined the issues related to false memory or the experiences of people on earth who've had what's now considered to be false memory syndrome and also mind control. And I have to say that I've never really entertained this as a possibility for me. A lot of people seem to be very concerned about it and that I have been somehow mind controlled or have false memories. But I've, after examining what has happened on earth with regards to false memory and mind control, I'm really confident that those things are not, haven't happened to me and are not happening to me. But I can elaborate a little bit more. Okay. <laughs> um, people who experience false memories are usually, they've usually been placed in a state of hypnosis or some kind of guided imagery or meditation. And it's often happened in the context of a therapeutic uh, situation with a counsellor or a, or a psychologist or someone. And uh, the person has suddenly recovered, uh, and I put that in inverted commas, a memory of something quite traumatic or momentous that's happened in their past that prior to that point they hadn't had any recollection or feelings about. The truth of what's actually happening in those cases is that people are being influenced by spirits. They're being given the experiences of spirits from the spirits and the spirits are attracted through this process. And usually the person on earth has a desire to avoid something within themselves. And this is what allows this interaction to happen with the spirit. But often the person on earth is avoiding some other pain they're avoiding a sense of feeling overlooked sometimes. Sometimes they have a desire for attention or a desire to distract themselves from mm -hmm. some other pain. Because they have that feeling, they become open to a spirit coming along and giving them some of the spirit's experience of what happened to them on earth. That's a very emotional experience for that person on earth and they then think, oh, this is a memory that I've had. The way that this cannot have happened to me <laughs> is that firstly, I've never been hypnotised. Yeah. I'm really crap at meditation <laughs> and guided <laughs> imagery. I, I would always be lying there going, oh, imagine the white gate. And it, was, you know, <laughs> it was a really hard thing for me to do so. And, and I have actually, because of the level, <laughs> the level of fears inside of me, I also have a really strong desire to stay in control of my body. Yeah. So I've always been really um, cautious about what's happening around me. And um, I can't, even as a medium, I find it difficult to trance, to give a spirit um, that much control of my body, that it's a complete trance mediumship. Um, I very much want to be in control and I'm not very open to suggestions. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, in that, that instance alone, in that um, example alone, I've never actually been hypnotised or placed myself in a situation where um, things can be suggested to me. Um, AJ and I don't meditate. We don't even discuss m the memories that I've had before I had them and even for some time after sometimes. Uh, so there hasn't ever been this kind of suggestive process where I'm sort of allowing, opening myself up to things without a conscious knowledge of what's going on around me. Yeah. Also, as I mentioned, things that commonly happen with people who have this false memory syndrome, I mentioned that they're usually trying to avoid something else that's occurring mm -hmm. in their <clears throat> life. So something that has actually happened to them that they feel afraid of or pain about or uncomfortable about or that they don't want to feel some aspect of their life. And so this memory, they're open to having another experience almost to distract them or to, get, to have some other deeper sort of addictive desire within them. Um, that's how they manifest this experience. 
For AJ and myself, and what we advocate to everyone, is that we deal with everything in our life that's happened. So for myself, in this process of now growing again towards God, developing myself in love, um, I am... I'm aiming to deal with not only the emotions associated with the memories of my first century life and life in the spirit world, but all of the things that have happened in the last 34 years. So there's no sense of, of avoiding this life yeah. by distracting myself with some other memories or emotions. I've certainly spent a lot of time in the last five years dealing with dynamics in my childhood, with my family, and various other things socially and how I feel about the world I'm in right now and things that have happened. So there's no sense that I, this, this experience is distracting me from some other yeah. deeper pain or fulfilling some desire for attention or glory because, <laughs> well, we may attract some level of attention. Um, certainly not very glorified <laughs> yeah a lot of people have quite negative feelings about us and because I'm being honest about this experience that I'm having yeah, yeah. so in that regard um, I feel that false memory syndrome is just not it's, I've never even entertained it as a as a, an idea of something that might be happening to me AJ's never suggested anything to me and as I mentioned in the previous answer I've been pretty strict on him about what I will and won't talk to him about especially in the beginning when we first met where I was feeling somewhat um, well I was feeling very resistive to this idea and I didn't ever want there to be a shadow of a doubt inside of me mm. that something could have been suggested to me. I wanted to be sure of myself and my own experience and, and I do feel that now and that's a lot because, you know, partly because I just told him I don't want you to even talk to me about what you remember of our life together or if we even had a life together in my... Uh, yeah, that's yeah. the feelings that I had then. Find out for yourself, for real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With regards to mind control, so this is also something that uh, I get accused of a lot, of being controlled by AJ and that somehow he's found some chink in my subconscious that has made me somehow invested in believing this or maintaining a relationship with him and that that's a condition of our relationship that I believe that I'm Mary Magdalene or various other things that people accuse me of and a lot of times people don't even really elaborate they just say oh you're controlled and to be honest I think it's a very very convenient way for them to dismiss me. They just say, oh, she's just someone without a mind of her own and she's controlled by this, this charismatic leader and, you know, therefore we don't have to listen to anything that she says or take any notice of her experience. So... It's pretty, pretty harsh. Yeah, <laughs> it is pretty harsh, actually. It yeah. is, yeah. But it's not, it's not true. No. no. <laughs> um, and there's probably... a a few things I could say about I think what typically happens to people who are mind controlled uh, from what I've read about it is that they often have a feeling that that love or approval from the person who's doing the controlling is conditional on them believing a certain set of things or feeling a certain way about them now that is definitely not the case between AJ and I mm. Um, I've actually had a lot of quite negative feelings towards him throughout the last five years because a lot of my fears were being brought up by this experience and I wanted someone to blame. Yeah. I, I blamed him a lot. I was quite harsh on him on like countless occasions, really, if I'm very honest. I was critical of the way he taught, of the way he looked, of the way he lived his life. I, I tried to find holes in everything because I just wanted to avoid the, the pain and fear that was being exposed within myself through this set of circumstances. Mm. Throughout all of that, he never wavered in his love for me. And he has said to me on many occasions that if I don't want to be with him, that's okay with him. <laughs> that he doesn't have that. And he is really okay with that now, you know. I I know that inside of him, that he would go on teaching divine truths and... He's had some sadness at times when I've said that I don't want to be with him because that has happened on numerous occasions throughout our relationship. 
He's had sadness to feel, but he's never made that sadness my problem or tried to make me feel guilty about that. He's, and, and now I, I feel he's reached a point where he, he wouldn't even really be sad. He'd mm. still desire to be with me, but it's not, it's not going to stop him going for what he wants. And uh, you look, uh, he views me as his, as his partner, as his lover, as his soulmate, not as someone who is subservient to him. And he doesn't promote me feeling subservient to him. I certainly don't think that he's God or mm. all-knowing or all-perfect <clears throat> or all-powerful. I don't have any of those feelings. And a lot of people who find themselves in situations where they are controlled in some way, th often they have given over their sense of their reasoning, what they think, working through things for themselves. And they've decided that the person in charge is the person with all knowledge and that they have none and they have no ability to gain any. Now, for myself, I've, I know that all truth comes from God, <laughs> not from AJ. He, has more tr he can reflect more truth right now and I listen to him a lot, but not in, if I don't agree with him, <laughs> I tell him, you know, and he knows that and he respects that about me, actually. He encourages me to have my own experience and to resolve things for myself. And in fact, there's been many times where he said, actually, you haven't, you're agreeing with me. You're, you're giving me like what I call lip service. You're saying yes, when you haven't actually sorted out this emotionally for yourself, whatever that may have been, a decision mm. to do something, a desire or a feeling about the, the, the way we were gonna live our life or what we were gonna do. There's been times when I've just said, yes, yes, all right. And he said, I can't do that because you are not in agreement with me from an emotional mm. perspective. And you don't have to be, so we won't do that thing. <laughs> Which is very different from someone holding someone else to ransom and saying, unless you agree with me, all bets are off or our life's over or you have to or I'm better or I don't have any of those kind of feelings in our relationship. So, yeah, I feel very confident that I'm, that I'm not being mind controlled and I've never felt that. No. AJ is a very humble, gentle person who's firm for what he knows and what he believes but he does ne he's never made my agreement with him mm. or my worship of him. He would find me worshipping him quite abhorrent <laughs> but he's never made my agreement with a certain set of rules or standards or or anything yeah. uh, conditional of his love for me and in addition I don't have a sense and he doesn't have a sense that I'm going to hell or I'm going to a bad place or terrible disaster will happen if I don't comply with something and this is also another way that many people are controlled. They're told that unless you do this thing, very, very bad things are going to happen to you or your family or, or you'll be in hell for f forever or you'll, um, you know, your level of ascension will get whatever. Yeah. There's, there's kind of horrible things that I've been told that other people have been told in various different um, what I would classify as cults where women have been told that they need to sleep with a certain amount of men otherwise they won't otherwise they're displaying uh, difficulties in their spirituality and they can't reach the next level and and all I would classify that as severe manipulation and control of others yeah. my life does not look anything like that <laughs> I'm, I'm really well loved and I have a re my own relationship with God I know that God's loving and that God never demands sacrifice from us or demands that we deny ourselves in order to have some greater thing happen to us. In fact, the only way to have great things happen to us is to be ourselves and heal mm. ourselves. And um, that's what AJ and I advocate for everyone around us. And it's no different within our relationship. It's cool. It's mm. cool. I'm just thinking with you, the mind control... Um, it's just fascinating in the sense that our families are the ones who are so mind controlling with the threats and the whatever and they're telling us they love us the most and yet you're accused of being mind controlled by someone who's doing the complete opposite with no threats whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. it's true. It's very common in family relationships, 
in a lot of organised religions as well, that people are told that unless you meet a certain set of standards or requirements or unless you do this for me on my birthday or unless you <laughs> come home for Christmas or whatever, then there's a threat. Yeah. And that is actually very controlling behaviour. I won't love you, you'll go to hell, this, this shows you're a bad person. All of these things are actually ways that we are controlled by society and our family and, and many other ways. Yeah. Um, and actually, myself and Jesus, or AJ as he's called now, we want to expose those things as unloving because no, it's, God doesn't want to control us. God wants us to use our will because we want to, not because we're afraid. God wants us to use our will in a loving direction because we're motivated by love within us and not fear. It's impossible, in fact, to use our will in a loving direction if we're motivated by fear. And this is why there is so much unhappiness on the planet, actually, because mm. a lot of people have reverted to using threats and um, various other emotional techniques to control themselves and others and the way the world, the world operates. And because of that, because that's actually compelling people to use their will through fear, we end up with a lot of unhappy people, both the people who do the threatening and the people who comply with the threats. So, um, yeah, it's not possible that I'm being <laughs> mind-controlled because I'm actually uh, living with someone who's passionate about <clears throat> ending control on the planet and empowering people through love. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. And also, I reckon, well, I'm asking here, it, it might, is it pretty confronting, like, coming from... A, a family in the last, you know, 30 years where you have, well, from my understanding is, and what I've read on, you know, what you post on the internet is yeah. that they are very controlling and manipulative and whatever, and suddenly to have someone who's expecting nothing from you, I mean, yeah. that's going to... Definitely. quite challenging. And, and maybe if we can give a bit of context here about my family, um, especially from the time that I met AJ... This sort of exposed in them a lot of their beliefs about love that were not, mm. that, that aren't loving, <laughs> and what how a family should behave, which is not loving, in that they felt that I should deny myself and my own experience and my own relationship in order to make them more comfortable. And that was a pretty yucky thing to happen. They were very afraid and mm. upset, but they still chose to use their will in a way that was damaging to me, it was hurtful to me and it was also quite unjust towards AJ because as you said he wasn't, he wasn't trying to control anyone, he was just being himself and being truthful and I decided that I wanted to be with him and my family told me outright that they couldn't cope with that and that he was evil. Um, and, which was just based on me actually making a decision for myself that did not agree with them and that's the first time in my life where I had really made a stand for something that my parents did not agree with. And, you know, I think a lot of people go through this process with their family, perhaps not their daughter meeting Jesus, but a lot of us get to a point in our lives where we realise, I need to have a life mm -hmm. that does not necessarily match with, well, that doesn't match with what, how my parents live their life or I have different beliefs from my, from my parents and I'm going to choose a different journey or route for my life. Some people don't, some people just live in the same way that their parents have lived, but then there are many others who reach a point where they say, I'm going to do something different with my life. And parents, some parents respond with encouragement. They say, okay, that's different, it might challenge me a bit, but great, it's your life. Sadly, other parents do what my parents have done, and that mm. is to say, I can't accept that, and you're wrong, and you're bad. And, um, yeah, so that's been really sad for me. And it was very confronting because I did realise how many emotional kind of contracts, I'm going to call it mm. contracts there was in my family, where I did a certain set of things and they did a certain set of things for me. So I was quite emotionally dependent upon my parents when I met AJ. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted them to reassure me about a lot of things and I was... I was a good daughter in ways that they deemed were good in return. 
And so breaking away from that, that's just one aspect of how many contracts there were. There was a lot of what I would call, you know, I'll give you this and you give me that. And none of that is love because it's all about barter. So when I met AJ, he's a man who does not barter. Mm. He doesn't want barter. If he finds me, and many, many times in the beginning of our relationship, I wanted barter because it made me feel secure. If I, have a, if I can give you something and then you give me something, I don't feel vulnerable or exposed. Yeah. I feel I have a role. I feel there's security and safety and surety of how this relationship's going to work. And AJ didn't want any of that. He, he found it quite oppressive and also... Um, sort of repulsive yeah. <laughs> you know, not that he ever found me repulsive but he would say I don't babe I don't want to do that with you like you don't want to be doing what you're doing for me right now and you're only doing it because you think you have to in order to get my love I love you you don't have to do that that was very confronting for me and it confronted probably the feelings of the lack of love mm. that there is in barter and I actually got quite angry as well at many times because I wanted, I felt vulnerable. Like AJ's a man who can do everything for himself. And I wanted a man who needed me for a few things. <laughs> because otherwise, what was my importance in his life? Yeah. How would he need me? How would I feel wanted? And that's all because I was more attuned with barter than I was with open hearted relating in a relationship. So he, he's giving me all of this love and attention and approval, but I felt like uncomfortable receiving it and certainly reciprocating it because it felt very exposed and there was no way of like securing what was going on. There was no way to say he needs me, he's not going to leave me um, because I do this thing for him. I can recognise many of those things in myself yeah. <laughs> and feel them both. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you for that. Have you considered that you believe you're Mary Magdalene because of the power of suggestion? Not really. <laughs> it's been suggested to me. <laughs> but I feel very confident that I don't believe. I feel very confident that I do, that I am Mary Magdalene, <laughs> but not as a result <laughs> of a suggestion. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a fair few reasons for that. Um, firstly, as I've mentioned to you, I think, in previous questions we filmed today, when I met AJ, I was, I was very vigilant about this possibility. Yep. Uh, I didn't <clears throat> want to ever have to feel like maybe I, this has all occurred to me through the power of suggestion. So I, I said to him, one of the very first things that I said to him was that, okay, if I'm going to be talking to you and just exploring this thing that I can't ignore anymore, uh, then I don't want you to talk to me about any memory that you have, none whatsoever. I don't want you to talk to me about the kind of person you felt I was in the first century, things that you feel happened to me in the first century, any memory that you have about what happened between us in the first century, any memory of what happened to you in the first century, I don't want to know any of it because if I'm going to have an experience, I want it to be, I want to know that it's come from me. And he honoured that request of mine. That's pretty amazing. It is pretty amazing. <laughs> um, I think he understood that for me it was, it was a really important thing yeah. that I was able to have my own experience. And so he honoured that until... Uh, a time some years ago where I said to him, after I'd had enough of my own experience, say, you know, I'm okay with that now. <laughs> you tell me now. Yeah. <laughs> and we've never, ever mm. sat down and had a... We've never sat down and gone, right, so this is the story yeah. of my life, this is the story of your life. It's not... That's not how this happens for us. Um, I've experienced a lot of memories and through that experience I've found... When I've spoken to him about those things, that we have, we've had the same experience. He's experienced these memories before and he knows what's happened and he might have even spoken to other people about it that I don't know. And I've had these experiences and we find that these memories meet, you know, that they... A lot of my memories are from the time before I met him and after he passed 
um, in the first century, but there's also a multitude of memories of when we're together. And so I've found that even though we've never talked about these things, when I've had those experiences and allowed them again, that our, that our experiences match up. But he certainly never suggested anything to me about any of that. <laughs> <laughs> I also yeah. think that um, in order for someone to be open to suggestion, they have to actually have an investment in wanting that suggestion to be true, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. Like you have to, if, if I was going to suggest something to you that you didn't, that, that held no, um, you had no desire for it to, to be true or it had no, it hadn't actually happened, then you would be able to dismiss it really easily. Totally. Yeah. And for me to <clears throat> accept that I'm Mary Magdalene based purely on suggestion, I would have had to have some feeling that I actually would like to be Mary Magdalene. And that's not really the case. You've confirmed that <laughs> yes. in this interview. Yes. <laughs> I've talked about it, that before. I, I really didn't have any feeling that I wanted to... I felt that accepting who I am and accepting who AJ is and living out our lives based on who we really are, not who the world would like us to believe, would mean ostracism, ridicule, rejection, possibly even violence, you know, and... So I didn't, I wasn't invested in this suggestion at all. And nobody, the only people who really probably suggested it to me, if you could even say that, and they'd be mortified that I said this, but <laughs> would be my parents in that they just said, oh, AJ Miller believes that you're soulmates. <laughs> <laughs> Unwittingly. Unwittingly, <laughs> yeah. Um, they certainly didn't. Oh, I don't know if they believe it or not, but... Yeah. Um, but, yeah, there was no, there's no suggestion. And even if that was a suggestion, I didn't really have any um, desire for it to be true. Yeah. It completely freaked me out, as I said. And even though I had this strong sense that I could, that it was true, I really didn't want it to be. And so, um, yeah, I don't feel that anything's been suggested to me. <laughs> mm. um, probably the other thing to say about suggestion is also that there's, while AJ didn't suggest anything to me about my memories, there's also no other suggestion, if you like, of what I experience or the life that I have a memory of anywhere else on the planet at the moment. There's no account of Mary Magdalene's life that marries with what I mm. know was, is, was my life. So th there's no way that I read a book and it suggested to me what I'm experiencing. You know, some interviewers say to us, oh, so the Da Vinci Code got it right. <laughs> just because, <laughs> just because um, we're saying we're Jesus and Mary Magdalene and we were married in the first century, you know. And I sort of think, uh, well, on that one point, you know, <laughs> but that's a, there's a lot of life yeah. that we lived on earth and in the spirit world. And, I, and that's not recorded anywhere on the planet at this point. There's elements of some details, some minor details that are recorded in the Bible and in, especially regarding my life, it's a little bit different for Jesus's life. But for me, there's some elements of truth in some things that are written and that I had never read. Mm. And I still haven't read most of them. But none of those things are an accurate depiction or an accurate account of my memories. So it's impossible that I've read something or been exposed to something which has suggested to me these memories or this experience, that, or who I am, if you like. Yeah. yeah. People often accuse AJ of claiming and convincing you that you are Mary Magdalene because you're young and pretty. How do you respond to these accusations? Yeah, there's a lot I'd like to say about this because it's something that often um, people will cast this sort of aspersion. I feel it's an aspersion on AJ's character, basically. Mm. Uh, in a, sometimes people, interviewers do it in like a cheeky kind of a way. Like, oh, it's very convenient though, isn't it, that Mary's young and pretty. And, and um, I, I, I often feel afterwards, oh, there's so much I wanted to say in that moment, but it's a moment and it's gone. And so it's great that we have the opportunity here to talk more about it. Mm. Um, probably the first thing I'd say is that I don't 
feel particularly young and pretty myself. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't, uh, yeah, I don't feel that um, he's hit the lottery in terms of uh, attractiveness or, or youth. Even I'm 35 in a couple of months, so I wouldn't say that I'm particularly young, though. I'm younger than a lot of people. Yeah. And, but, you know, I sort of feel like I'm not just 35, I suppose. I feel that I have had a lot of life and so I don't feel particularly young. But let's get on to really how I would respond to this accusation. And that is to say, firstly, that AJ hasn't really had it that easy, I suppose, since he met me. Like, it hasn't been... He didn't wander up to me and say, oh, you're Mary Magdalene, and I fell into his arms and said, this is wonderful <laughs> and let's please go and have lots of sex. <laughs> it wasn't the movies. No, it wasn't. It wasn't the movies or anything resembling it except maybe a little bit like a, a horror movie, maybe. <laughs> um, a bit extreme. A bit extreme, maybe. But, but let's, mm. let's explain a bit more. Yeah. So uh, when I met AJ, I was really confronted about this idea of, um, him being Jesus, me being Mary Magdalene in a public way. Mm. I, I felt really afraid about it. I felt really confronted about now that I started to allow all these emotions um, that I'd been suppressing all my life, what was coming up. Things were coming out. I was angry for the first time in my life, really. And that I found that really disturbing and distressing of what's going on. You know, I just, I'm feeling... Um, a lot of things that I, I can feel were already inside of me uh, and I had some sense of wanting to grow, but growing this way seemed very confronting. I also, as we've mentioned in previous questions, you know, the way AJ wanted to have a relationship with me was based on no expectations, no barter, no codependency, just love and desire. And for me, that was really confronting as well. I felt like, um, like vulnerable. I couldn't. There was no way I could manipulate this man, and he wanted. All he wanted to do was love me, but that felt really confronting. And I, because I was really afraid of how my family was reacting, how the how I felt the world would respond to these things. I got I got really afraid and then angry. I did, I wanted to not have a relationship with him. I broke up with him like about three times. So we're in and out of relationship. It was quite, you know, it wasn't sort of this walk in the park for AJ. He, he was coping with a lot of emotions that I was throwing his way and a lot of blame and a lot of desire to control him. So I wouldn't say that, you know, it probably felt very convenient to him. Yeah. I know how he feels and he feels or he knows that I'm his soulmate and he doesn't want anyone else. But um, I've often said to him, babe, if you were going to choose, you know, if you were some <laughs> evil mastermind and you were going to choose people to be members of these 14 soul people who've returned to Earth, you could have made better choices <laughs> <laughs> because I'm tenacious and stubborn and not very humble and I get angry and, you know, a lot of us are like that because there's a lot of fear in us. Mm -hmm. A lot of us resist a lot and so when anyone is in resistance to their feelings, they can become pretty nasty. Yep. So, yeah, so I wouldn't say this implication that AJ's just chosen me because I'm young and pretty, yeah. um, that doesn't really match. There's actually a lot of other women who would like to be with AJ, who find him really attractive and who would like to feel like they're Mary Magdalene. Um, so he could have, you know, if he was going to go shopping <laughs> for yeah. a relationship, he could have done that. And he didn't because that's not the nature of the man. Um, but certainly he's, he's not been in a situation where it's all been, I've been adoring of him. Mm. And there's been times in our relationship, as I said, where we've split up, where we haven't had sex for periods of six months because I've been working through an issue, um, where I've, you know, where I've really resisted love. And that hasn't always been easy for him either. And so this implication that he's just sort of chosen a convenient partner so that he can have lots of sex or, you know, feel important because he has a pretty girlfriend or something, that's, that's not the case at all. Simply based on the fact that it hasn't really been an easy time for him in terms of me just opening my heart and falling in love. 
The second thing I probably want to say about that is that AJ's quite a catch himself. <laughs> he's, he's a gorgeous looking man who has just got a beautiful heart. He, all he desires to do is to love and to serve others. And so this, when people say, um, you know, it's quite convenient for you, AJ, that Mary's young and pretty, I think, well, it's quite convenient for me. <laughs> you know, yeah. I feel like I won the lottery when it comes to soulmates. I feel like I, this is, this is amazing, you know. And while, as I said, in the beginning times, I didn't always feel like that. You know, I felt really a lot of resistance and quite angry a lot of the time. These days when, you know, when people say that, I think, wow, you know, I actually, I feel like he's a pretty amazing, attractive guy himself so I don't feel like he's sort of I don't know I, that's that's what I always <laughs> want to say anyway <laughs> probably the biggest thing though in responding to these kind of comments is just that it it casts a lot of um it's sort of an underhanded way of accusing AJ of being someone who is just looking he's preying on women in some way for sex or for you know he just wants to be in the company of someone who's young and pretty rather than seeing that he actually wants to have a, a an adult loving relationship with his soulmate and that there's only one of me and that even in times when it it seemed like we couldn't be together he wasn't looking for someone else mm. and in fact before we met he was celibate for five years because he knew he didn't want to have a relationship with anyone but his soulmate. And then obviously when we met, we didn't, we're didn't. we still working towards having a really harmonious and loving relationship. So, yeah, I suppose it, the, the main thing I feel when people say these kinds of things is it's a, often a simple offhand kind of a comment, but there's a lot in it that is really kind of insulting to AJ. And towards me, it kind of makes me seem like I'm just a bit of a bimbo <clears throat> um, and but it also implies that he's sort of chosen me and mm. that's not the way it works with soulmates God created the two of you together and there's no choice about who the other half of you is and both of us respect that and AJ really loves that and that's not um, that's a beautiful part of his character that he wants to love only one woman who is the other half of him and that he's willing to be really humble to whatever comes up in that process so that we can be closer together. And that's very different from the accusation that somehow he's selected a young pretty girl t and convinced her to be Mary Magdalene. Yeah. 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 I agree. I think it's, it's, quite, a, um, it's quite a yuck comment, actually. Like, it yeah. I feel pretty gross. Yeah. As you yeah. say, it's pretty yucky towards AJ as well. Yeah. Yeah. And once again, as you say, so many of these comments are made underhandingly or the person who makes them, and I'm, I've been responsible, for not that, that comment, yeah. but other comments, without even thinking what, like, you don't realise the impact of what you're actually saying mm. and, and just the put down that it, it's towards you guys but to anybody, you know, yeah. that you make these comments to. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot there's a lot that can be revealed about our underlying beliefs in little offhand comments and um, th I feel there's a lot of cynicism on the planet about yeah. um, a lot of people don't believe that people could just be good and be motivated by a desire to be good people and because of that there's a lot of suspicion cast at AJ a lot of the time. Yeah. 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 You get sucked in it as well, I suppose. Well, you, well, it's both of you, really, isn't it? I mean, though, in this particular one, they are claiming you're more of a bimbo than a <laughs> than an intelligent <laughs> half of a soul. Yes. Yeah. I think also because AJ, as we've said in other questions that we've been talking about today, because I have been reluctant to yeah. be forward, because I have um, wanted to hide in the background, because I've wanted to sort of... Um, control him into not being as transparent and open and direct with people and he hasn't listened to that and he has been open and direct with people a lot of people he, he often cops a lot of the um, the suspicion or the attack because in a sense my lack of certainty or um, it's not really a lack of certainty my fear-driven actions 
um, mean that people don't take me as seriously. Yeah. And that's certainly something that I'm, that I'm working through now. Like, I feel that I want to be counted as, you know, as myself and this is what I believe and this is who I am. But that's not always been the case. So he's sort of copped a lot of... And also, I suppose, saying you're Jesus on the planet today is different to saying you're Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Uh, there's so much expectation and fear about uh, expectation of who Jesus should be and then fear about a man saying that he's Jesus and what dark motivations he might have. It means that AJ is actually exposed to a lot of people's um, attack and ridicule and it's almost like he has to prove himself 70 times over yeah. um, and even then it's not enough for people to trust him or to believe him. Yeah. Yeah. Big challenges, hey? Well, yeah. not. It's not really... It, it, uh, well, that's my stuff speaking because I don't think that... Um, just from you know, our, co our conversation today and the questions that you've answered, the more that you are, are owning who you are and being yourself, it's actually like the more that um, I'm around you, it's like... Well, yeah, I'm only thinking this now. It's like that... You don't question you so much, yeah. You know, and it's like I can, like I know with Jesus, I can see it's my issues. You know, he's very firm and, and whatever. And the same, same with you. It's like when you, you guys are very firm, or when you're firm with who you are or whatever. Yeah. Then, then it does put it back on the person if they're willing to see that. I think. Yeah, it, um, it depends on how humble the person is. Yeah. But I think probably you were saying about the challenges. Hmm. I feel these things are challenges to us while we still have fear about them. Yeah. So for me, it still feels challenging to be really public and open about who we are, but it's becoming less challenging the more I deal with the fears I have associated with it. So I think um, for any of us with any challenge that we face, the more willing we are to release the fears and grief we have around those things. And I know AJ has been in that process for a lot more years than me. And I know that he's had to grieve at certain points just the level of um, hatred or ridicule that comes towards him simply being himself. But because he's done that, it's not really so much of a challenge for him anymore. And I've, I firmly believe that both of us will reach a point where it's not challenging us in the slightest. Yeah. Um, and he's pretty close to that point, especially when it comes to talking about who he is. Um, but any challenge that we face, as we develop this relationship with God and deal with our fears and our false beliefs, essentially, around those challenges, then they, they begin to not be challenges anymore. Yeah. And that's, that's a really hopeful thing, isn't it? That's the exciting thing. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Oh, thank you. Don't you believe you're Mary Magdalene just to please AJ or Jesus and so that you can have a relationship with him? Aren't you just blinded by your love for him and doing and saying things to please him? I think this one's a little bit funny. <laughs> just, just the thought that I am blinded by my love for, for AJ or Jesus, Jesus, whichever you want to call him. Because as I've mentioned in some previous questions that we've talked about today, certainly um, when we met it wasn't a magical romance. <laughs> I didn't fall madly in love. I didn't feel blindly in love with him. Uh, in fact, I was really confronted by his level of honesty, by his desire to share divine truth publicly. And I tried for a long time to prevent him doing that, to control him doing that, uh, from, to control him into not doing that. And also it was a bit of a turn-off because it was creating so much it was triggering so much fear inside of me that he was being public about who he is and he was um, challenging so many people through his honesty and truthfulness, directness with them. I actually found in the beginning that um, my attraction to him was quite hot and cold because I'd feel attracted to him I feel that he's a, a wonderful guy and I felt attracted to the truth that he gave and I could feel that his character was good um, and he was a great looking guy and all of these things. Um, and then uh, my fears would be triggered 
And I would actually feel quite the opposite. I would feel like I don't even find you physically attractive. I don't want to be with you. I, you know, I don't even really like you is some of the things that I have, you know, felt or said to him in the past. So I certainly, it's not valid to think that I've been blinded by my love for AJ. And the love that I do feel for him has grown through me growing in humility and releasing different things from myself, different fears. And because of that, my heart has opened more and I see him more for the man that he really is. Uh, so I, I'm not um, controlled by him. I don't feel that the only way to have a relationship with him is to believe that I'm Mary Magdalene. I've had a friendship with him since I've known him and for some of that time, I wanted to believe that I wasn't Mary Magdalene. Even though I felt it, I wanted to, I, you know, I said, that's it, I'm not. And I tried to live my life as not, uh, trying to forget what the realisation had exposed inside of me. And I, it didn't work very well for me. I actually became really miserable. Mm. Um, and I did, uh, but through that time, I didn't have contact with him for about three or four months. And then we did have some intermittent contact, but it was purely on a friendship basis. And he was, he was fine with me. He didn't share my belief, and I knew he didn't share my belief, but he didn't force on me that I had to believe that I was Mary Magdalene in order to have a friendship with him. And I didn't really want to have anything more than a friendship with him at that time. And at various times throughout the last five years, I've really only wanted to have a friendship with him because I've found the intimate and romantic and emotional side of our relationship to be really confronting. Uh, so I wouldn't say that I fed, fell head over heels in love with this man um, who made it a condition that mm. I believe I'm Mary Magdalene in order to know him or to be with him. Um, what else can I say about that? Probably that AJ really wants me to be myself. He, he doesn't want me to do things to please him. And in fact, as I've mentioned again previously, when I met him, a lot of my feelings of what a romantic or close relationship should be was based on codependency. And so uh, providing the partner filling some emotional holes in myself, so providing me emotion so I didn't have to feel certain things, and me doing the same for my partner. And I felt that, that I should please him that I should do things for him in order to get him to love me and care for me. And every time I tried to do that, he stopped me. <laughs> so while I wasn't saying, oh, I'm Mary Magdalene to please him, because <laughs> the, the desire for codependency did not extend to that point, but certainly me um, modifying my desires in day-to-day -day life, like where we should eat, what we should do, those kinds of things, I tried that a lot. And in every case, he said, well, no, you don't even want to do that. You're just doing that to please me and I can't, I can't have that. I want you to be yourself. Mm. I want you to experience your own desires and have your own life. And so, um, yeah, I'm not, uh, there's absolutely no conditions in the man that I should be a certain way in order for him to love me. In fact, his love is so unconditional that even at times when I've been quite nasty to him, he's still maintained love towards me and patience and kindness and has never reverted to being nasty in return. So, um, no, I don't feel that, uh, well, I know that. <laughs> I'm, that I'm not just saying something to please him or to, in order to get his love and approval. Because I know that I would have his love no matter what I chose for my life. Even if I chose to not be with him, I know that I would have his love. But also, I've had my own experience. I'm having my own experience. And as I've mentioned previously, I was very sure, definite with him that I didn't want him to even impact on my, own, on my experience and that I wasn't going to be believing or saying or, you know, even entertaining the idea that I was Mary Magdalene unless it was based on my own experience. And I have had and continue to have my own experience. And even if AJ fell off the face of the earth, I'd still be Mary Magdalene. <laughs> so it's not a condition. It's not that... a condition of our relationship. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 
Why do you have to say that you're Mary Magdalene, even if you are? Surely it would be better just to keep that to yourself. <laughs> yeah. That's, well, it's certainly been my preference in the past. <laughs> and when I met AJ, I think I said something very similar to him. Even if you are Jesus, why do yeah. we have to talk about it? <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, but, look, there's a lot of reasons why I think it's important to say the truth about who I am. I feel it's important to my relationship with God, but also to have personal integrity and in my relationship with others and with myself. Um, in the past, I've felt just afraid of how other people would respond to me saying it. And I've also felt that my experience, it's difficult for other people to relate to because they're not having the same experience of having had a life on earth before and in the spirit world and then coming back and having another body and another experience and coming to terms with the memories of all of that and the psychological aspects of that. I felt that people won't be able to relate to it, so why should we talk about it? I felt that, um, it, you know, even speaking about my experience of memories at times, because I know that it's so different from what other people experience, I felt like people are just going to feel like I'm crazy. And even at times, I felt like this is a little bit crazy. I feel a little bit crazy, and I didn't, I didn't like feeling those things. So I just wanted to avoid the whole thing. But I have gone through this process of coming to really feel in my heart how important it is that I, that I am honest and open about who I am. Probably the first thing is that I'm involved in giving public seminars and lectures, uh, teaching divine truth. And one of the really key principles involved <laughs> in, in the teaching of divine truth is that uh, how important it is to truthfully present yourself to others uh, and so if I was to stand up in front of people and hold a belief about who I am and keep it to myself then I would be a hypocrite mm. when it, in terms of what we're teaching and also I feel that it me saying who I believe or who I am and the experiences that I have up front, or at least giving people the opportunity to know those things up front. Certainly, we don't lead every seminar with that, yeah. but we're open about that with people. Um, and we have all these video material on YouTube now that makes it very open and clear for people to see. And I feel that is actually most loving to people because it gives them the opportunity, first up, before they decide if they want to listen to anything else, to know who they're hearing this information from and what those people feel about themselves. I mean, we know it about ourselves, but for them it might be a matter of opinion. Um, but at least they have the opportunity to make a well-informed decision in that if we were to hide those things, people might feel really tricked or cheated when we were eventually open about it. And I feel this is most loving f towards them, that they know who we are uh, from the beginning. The second thing is that I feel that, well, I know that all of God's laws respond to truth, that God's designed his whole universe around these principles that uh, mean that the laws act with us when we are truthful and that they respond to us positively, to us opening to more truth and to more love. And so even though at times I might feel like, gosh, even more people would listen to us if we just hid who we were, <laughs> you know, because this message that we're teaching is very loving and logical and it's practical and people can experiment with it and know if it's true. And, and there's been times where I've thought, well, if we didn't say who we were, which is what puts a lot of people off initially, more people might listen and they might have more happiness in their life. But if, if I... Well, if I honour the truth that I know that all of God's laws respond to us being truthful, <clears throat> then, I, then I have faith that by me being honest and truthful, the best set of circumstances will work out for everyone involved. And the, the most possibility for love to grow will exist if I am truthful mm. because then I'm more in harmony with God's laws. And so I'd be crazy not to be truthful. So that's probably the biggest thing that I feel about um, being open about who I am is that 
if I wasn't open about who I, who I am, then not only would I be lacking just personal integrity and lacking the um, humility to deal with whatever people decided to feel about me as a result, like I'd be hiding behind a facade and trying to present, prevent other people's true feelings. And by hiding the truth, I, pre I actually prevent other people exposing the truth of how they really feel inside of them. So not only that, but also I'd be in disharmony with God's laws. Mm. And to me, I don't want to live my life in disharmony with God's laws anymore, even though I'm still out of harmony <laughs> with lots of them. I'm really um, attempting to bring my will into harmony with them because I know that's how we grow and that's how we can know God. That's yeah. pretty cool. And are you finding now that you've actually... From when I first met you to now, I feel like you're embracing who you are, like, exponentially. Like, it's completely different from when yeah. I first met you. Yeah, sure. And are you finding, like, um, that there's a real proof? You know, like, for you, like, this, this sense of a real confirmation of those things with God's laws as you do this? Definitely, Eloisa. I'm, I'm much happier. And the more fear I confront, the happier I become. Yeah. And I'm still not happy all of the time. There's still lots of fears and grief inside of me. But the more willing I am to embrace myself, the more of that gets dealt with. Yeah. When I first met you, I was so afraid of just even exploring emotionally the truth that I knew about myself, that I hid it not only from you, but I really tried to suppress it inside of myself. And I was, I was unhappy as you probably saw, you know, and I wasn't yeah. confident because I, and, and that couldn't change in me until I, and it has been a gradual process that I've been going through of, of coming to terms with the fact that if I'm humble <laughs> to what I already feel um, and what's being triggered by this knowledge of who I am and if I embrace the truth about those things, then then I'll grow, you know, yeah. that's the only way that I've been able to grow. And that's, I think that's why you see a sort of an exponential thing happening because when I'm in complete denial, everything's shut down. And as soon as I decided to open up more to emotion and open up more to like being truthful about who I am in every situation, then it is, it is an exponential growth that's possible. It's not linear anymore, it's sort of exponential. And I certainly feel that in the last six months or so since we've had, diff and I spoke about this recently at a seminar, we had some, we've had various media interactions over the years and for me it's always triggered all of those fears that I've had about how, who's going to see this, what are they going to think of me, people are going to recognise me, oh, you know, <laughs> like, oh, nightmare, you know. Um, and they're going to be attacking, they already think we're idiots, they're just making fun of us. And all of this stuff, I'd go into an interview just sitting on that stuff, not, not releasing the fear and grief I had around it. And because of that, I didn't even really express myself very well in those interviews. I didn't, didn't come off really as myself, I don't think. I wasn't really being myself. And it was just a really negative experience for me. In the last six months, I decided I had a different choice <laughs> and that was to be more humble to the whole process, which if you think about it, if I'm saying, you know, that I've been teaching divine truth or being a part of the teachings of divine truth for five years, that's a long time coming, that decision, mm -hmm. to actually just be humble to this, this media interaction stuff. And that's because I think it was such a long time coming because it triggered some of my really, really deep fears deeply held fears about being well known, about being attacked, about appearing crazy. And but I, you know, eventually <laughs> understood that I had a choice here and that mm. could that would be to be myself and not just say who I am, but be myself. Mary Magdalene in the interview, express myself. <laughs> and um, while there's still a lot of other emotions within me that affect how those interviews go. I felt a lot happier in those interviews because I wasn't trying to minimise or apologise or avoid who I was. There's still other emotions that cause people to think that, to dismiss me sometimes because I have feelings of 
um, feeling insignificant inside of myself and so I attract that or there's other things that go on but certainly the projections that are you know the the beliefs that other people have about us that I can feel that we're crazy or silly or somehow bad they don't they because I've decided to be myself and be humble I actually work through a lot of those emotions before I got into that interview chair yeah. <laughs> and because of that I had fun for some parts of it I had fun and I thought that would never be possible. Yeah. Um, you know, I just thought it would be the worst thing in the world for any camera to be <laughs> aimed at me. <laughs> and while I didn't have fun in the sense that I felt, oh, yeah, it's great, there's cameras on me, <laughs> yeah. I had the simple joy of just being able to be myself in a situation where I hadn't been able to, I hadn't, my fears, my listening to my fears had meant that I didn't allow myself to be myself so yeah I feel that my happiness is improving all of the time and I'm really getting this proof that God's laws do respond to truth and our humility and it's sort of crazy how good it is when you do that like to actually test the theory not just talk about it mm -hmm. and to feel the experience of not only change within yourself but change in what you attract that's pretty powerful yeah pretty cool yeah Thank you, sister. Yeah, thanks so much Thank for you. your time and, and sharing your life. It's been cool. As I said to you, I think a book <laughs> would be awesome. <laughs> so well, FAQs, a visual I'm book. Ha I'm happy to start here. <laughs> but thank you very much for spending the time. And it's did, my pleasure. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. And Anytime. Thanks to yeah, thanks, Lena and Igor yeah. on the cameras. <laughs>